Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Green, and with me is my wife, Dee. As we continue to work our way back, we believe the first thing to get back to is prayer. After 40 years of ministry, we know that prayer changes things. You're not alone. If you need prayer, call the MTC Christ is Center prayer line. Or submit your prayer request online, mtcfc.org. Remember, Remember, we're we're here here for for you, and and we've got your back. Praise the Lord, my friends, and good evening or good day or good morning if you're catching it in the morning on Facebook and YouTube. Whatever time it is, it's the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, Well, let's jump right into it. You're seeing the backdrop here. I'm Steve Green, the senior pastor of More Than Conquerors. We're getting ready for a black history special. Amen. Uh, All month long in February, uh, it's been the celebration of the black race, the Negro race, the African-American race. Many titles we go by, but we just celebrated what God is doing, the black race here, the the, the history, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, literally, we're calling it uh, the glorious history and feats, not feats uh, and Ebonics, F-E-E-T-S. No, feats, like, as in defeat means you did win. Feats mean you won, the glorious History. We got a lot of history we will not cover, but we're calling it the glorious history and feats of the black race. Amen. Well, obviously, a disclaimer before I introduce the way it's going to go. I'm sporting this, uh, well, this is not a disclaimer. I'm sporting this shirt, Hamilton. I'll tell you about that a little bit more as a Broadway play. A tribute to uh, Alexander uh, Hamilton, an Im- immigrant from the Caribbean, Caribbean Sea that did some wonderful things. Talk about that in a moment. But uh, we want to just as a disclaimer say we're not going to go in all of the history. If you're looking for, you know, just tracing blacks back, blacks back into the Bible, I'll leave that to Elder Thompson. He did that last year and he talked about after the, um, uh, the flood, how the races started. With Ham, Sham, and Japheth, right? Ham, not Birmingham, but Ham, the black race. And is the black race cursed? Now, you're going to find out we are not cursed at all. Matter of fact, you can't be cursed and, and, and do the kind of glorious things that we've seen. As I just love this prop, the, the full shot of the whole banners and all these colors that are vibrant. And they're red and, uh, you know what I'm saying, the orange and green and uh, uh, yellow and all of that. Hey, Amen. It's just it's so so uh, uh, picturesque, amen, it's so glorious. So we've done some glorious things. So we will not go into all of the descendants of Ham and all down through the race and what, uh, you know, uh, countries we were part of, whether we were uh, as slaves in uh, in London or with accidents or France or wherever we were, uh, all the colonies and those kind of things. So we won't go into all that. We're just going to do literally what they did uh, in Acts, uh, chapter uh, 7. We're going uh, we to give the history. Now, somebody said, is it even appropriate to even do that every year, to give the history? Well, in uh, the America, the European, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, we, we do that on 4th of July, stars and stripes forever. Oh, say, can you see? You know, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America. We get that, but we know how we got here. So we want to go back and look at some of the glorious history that some of the feats and victories that took place had it not been for the glory of God living and walking with these people, sharpening their minds, never would have made it. <laughs> I think Marvin Sapps or somebody says, right? So we, we won't get into the, all the witty inventions and the George Washington Carver and how many things he did with the peanut. We, time would fail me. I almost want to say like Hebrews 11 when it gives just a, a plethora of uh, leaders that did great things by faith back then. 
what we're going to show you is we're going to present some presenters that will be giving us what we're doing now, some of the things we've seen. Now, we won't always get into Tiger Woods, time with Fail Fam- Me, uh, or Muhammad Ali, or LeBron James, but some other people may. You know what I'm saying? We won't get into everything that took place. I'm sure uh, one of our presenters may because we've been great on a lot of things, amen, but the glorious history. In Acts 7, coming after, out of Acts chapter 6, the church is world is uh, uh, well on the way about to impact the entire world, right? Starting in Jerusalem, Day of Pentecost, and uh, in chapter 4, man, they pray until the Holy Ghost fills the place. Chapter 6 is growing so uh, uh, astronomically that they got to get deacons to handle the daily ministration. Then everybody's wondering, what's the history? Where did this move come from? Right in the smack the beginning of of the book of Acts, chapter 7, the history of Israel is given. I mean, the history, it takes it from Abraham. Matter of fact, in, uh, over in, in Acts 7, verses 1 and 2, it says, The God of glory has appeared to Abraham with all that Israel did in slaying giants and the Ruth and the Esthers and the Ezekiel and the Daniels and the Hoseas and the Joel and the Amos and the, uh, you know, Nahum and the Habakkuk and the Malachi and the Jonahs, all that history, all, all that uh, was just awesome. Uh, uh, God split Red Sea. I mean, he did a lot for the uh, uh, Israelis, but we're talking tonight. Has God ever done anything for us? And is he going to do anything for us? And is he through with us? I come to remind you tonight. We've come to remind you that the African-American uh, 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 race, the Negroes, the blacks, uh, with all of our challenges, and we got some, uh, that we serve the God of three dimensions. Uh, he's the God that was. He's the God that he is. Uh, and he is the God that is to come. He is the almighty God. And we bless him for keeping us alive Though the enemy would like to kill us through genocide, there is a parallel between Israel and, uh, and, the, and the black race. But God delivered both with a mighty hand, and he doth deliver. That's what Corinthians says. We give praise and thanks to God. We would not have you ignorant, Second Corinthians. I feel like preaching a little bit here. Well, we don't want you ignorant about math, about science, about sports, about entertainment. Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 10, he says we will not have you to be ignorant or allow you to ignore or forget uh, the troubles that we had as Negroes and blacks in Africa and America. The trouble Paul says that they had in Asia, that we were pressed beyond measure, even to the point of death and despair life that many hung themselves and thought about committing suicide because of all of the of the slavery is about, because, but then we thank God that God is the abolisher, amen, that through the abolitionists and through all those he abolished. He's a demolitionist. He, I mean, he literally became a one-man wrecking crew, a demolition crew, and how God anointed Jesus, who went about doing good, healing all those that were oppressed. And oppressed means to be under slavery, to have your foot on their neck. The enemy had his feet on our neck, but God would turn the ties and cause the glory to come in, just as he did with Abraham. And he says, and the God of glory had appeared to Dr. King, and the God of glory had appeared to Harry and Tubman and the God of glory to Frederick Douglass and the God of glory would appear to Barack Obama and the God of glory and the God of glory of where you are. I better quit. I got some presenters coming. I'll pick it up on the back end. Amen. And so a whole chapter is given in Acts chapter 7 about the God of glory. That's why we're calling this tonight uh, the glorious history. Yeah, we have some things we don't want to talk about, but we're talking about the glorious history and feats of the black raise the african-american race the negro race so let's get ready now this this shirt is one of the things uh actually it was a gift my wife give, had given me a couple of weeks ago i think uh, she i know down at the birmingham jefferson civic center that was a broadway play called hamilton right and she brought together some glorious women from every sector of life too many of them to call them and they uh, they went to see that play there and uh alexander hamilton matter of fact his name uh, is on the money i think it's a ten dollar bill so we're suggesting your money is getting ready to change <laughs> hamilton for the hamilton for the hams for the ham generation for the burning ham for the negroes that came out of ham ham milton meal is when the working meal 
mill than the than, than ton. Ham mill, ton. Ham mill, H-A-M, ham, descendants, M-I-L, work mills and factories and tons. Uh, that's the weight of God. <laughs> Amen. So we expecting a ton of the weight of glory to come to, for people, uh, immigrants like Alexander Hamilton to do wonderful things uh, so that, uh, man, by the time we through, we ain't going to just be talking about money. We're going to be on the money and we're going to own the money <laughs> just like the A.G. Gastons and all other entrepreneurs uh, have done in Birmingham right before our eyes. So without any further ado, let me just go ahead at one time because we're going to present these one by one here. Um, Doctor, first of all, uh, in several categories, we'll be dealing with uh, Dr. Wanaki Adams, a very successful uh, optometrist, my personal optometrist, uh, uh, downtown on uh, that Fifth Avenue uh, place there. She's been there for years and in business over 40 years, telling us how blacks have achieved and succeeded in business. And then we uh, won't just talk about, uh, you know, um, blacks in business here, but we'll go a little bit further than that. The Civil Rights, Dewana Thompson, director of the Civil Rights. Very young, by the way, considering, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and she'll be telling us with all that music so, you know, she's loaded. She's young. She'll give us history. That's Elder Thompson's daughter, as you well know. I'm sure he's yet proud of her, Dewana Thompson. And she just, I mean, she's just a leader, man. Ain't no other way to put it. So please listen to her words. Uh, and then we'll hear uh, from Elder uh, George Stewart, uh, George W., the entertainer. In that same uh, district, he was the um, um, a manager of WENN, and he worked with Sparrow Records, and he does the American Gospel Quartet Convention. And I mean, he's, I uh, think he missed his day job. I think he's a comedian, too. I don't know if we see that size. You know how he does. If he calls you, you don't know if you're talking to somebody out of Hollywood or what. But very brilliant, very succinct, giving us how we have made it over. We understand the Sydney Poitiers and all of those uh, that, uh, Lena, you know what I'm saying, the, the, those that have been in entertainment. We certainly look forward to hear what he's got to say, the feats that have taken place there. And then uh, I'll come back after a little Stewart, do, do a little mid here. Now, uh, uh, we'll close it with what happened uh, with uh, sports with Elder uh, Kerry Napper giving us some history there. You know, we just had a Super Bowl, two black quarterbacks in the Super Bowl, tremendous feats. And then, of course, Dr. Cadelia Anderson, blacks in music. Now, it should be obvious, Dr. Cadelia, she's a voice director over at Alabama State University. It should be obvious why I'm uh, going to ask her to uh, come last because hopefully maybe she'll drop a song, a little sweet song or something for and I'll I'll put the icing on the cake, whatever she's saying. I may sing a little summer shelf, sing a little summer shelf. Don't know what I'm going to do. All right, without, <laughs> without any further delay, let's get this first segment started. A Black History Special, More Than Conquer Style, The Glorious Gospel and Feasts of the uh, black uh, African-American Negro race. My name is Dr. Wanaki Adams, and I am an optometrist, and I practice in the downtown Civil Rights District at 1712 Fifth Avenue North. I've been in practice for 43 years. My topic of discussion today is black in business. As an optometrist and an optometrist in private practice, I have the unique experience of not only selling a product, which is eye care and eye wear, but also providing a service such as eye examination, low vision care, and contact lens examination. What I'd like to do today is talk about black business in general and then share some of my experiences as an optometrist in private practice. More than two million blacks are in business in the United States. And today, what I'm gonna do is, as an optometrist, I can be, and a speaker, I can be a little verbose. So I'm gonna use the phone as my focal point just like you have two eyes, I have two hands, the phone in one hand as a focal point, and the mic in the other. The worldwide technology is the largest black-owned business in the country. And as you probably know, one of the most famous entrepreneurs is none other than Oprah Winfrey. 
But let me give you a little history of the genesis and the inception of black business. J.T. Ward in 1881 was the first black business. And his, he had a company was uh, called E.E. E. Moving and Storage Company. Jeremiah Hamilton, the first richest black man in the United States. And guess what? He was Wall Street first black trader around 1806 to 1875, 1875. And I'm, 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 I'm purposeful in, in, in doing this. I'm, I'm laying the foundation. I'm going to give a little history. You can't appreciate where you're going unless you understand where you come from. And the first black billionaire, and I said billionaire, is Robert Johnson. And he became a billionaire in 2001 when he sold BET. And for you who like to eat, like myself, Jones Barbecue in Mariama, Arkansas is the oldest black restaurant and it was founded in 1910. That's, if my math serves me correct, that's over a hundred years. Now, I look at the world through the eyes of sight and vision. And I am gratefully, graciously, and humbly honored to have this privilege to share with you some of my discoveries through my 40 years of practice. A little history. When I first started optometry, optometry I was the first black female licensed in the state of Alabama. That was in 1980. At that time, there were only three other optometrists in practice, one in Mobile, one in Selma, and one at the School of Optometry. And all of, they, all of them were black males. So you can imagine the daunting task of being the first. Not only was I the first black optometrist, but this was my first job. So the learning curve was steep. But you know what? I may have been the first, but I knew I would definitely not be the last. As a matter of fact, I promise, I'm, I'm trying to be like those young people, use one hand and click, 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 so bear with me. I promise God and myself that given the opportunity, I would make the path brighter and the load lighter for those who came behind me. And God in his infinite wisdom and faithfulness has done just that. You know, I don't know it to be a fact, but I believe it to be true. The common denominator, the running theme, the prevailing quality in blacks in business, the longevity, the success, the achievement is the audacity to believe. Now that's vision. Seeing yourself in the future, doing and having what you set out to achieve. Vision is an intricate part of business. You start with the vision because without a vision, the people perish. You maintain a clear focus. And by the way, during the process, some refocusing will need to take place, but that's why you have the lens to accommodate. And accommodate means to change your focus from far to near and near to far. And for some of us, or those of us who are over 50, well, over 40, you lose the ability to see up close, and that's why you need bifocals. But as I was saying, vision is a part of business. And the last part, to have a business to thrive, you need visualization. And visualization is seeing 
the future as now. Calling those things that be not as though they were. Besides vision, two other qualities that I think is necessary, and that's passion and flexibility. See, passion pulls and vision pushes. Flexibility is when you are comfortable changing direction in midstream and you can imagine, and, and, and those of you in business or even those who you are thinking about coming in, in, into business, know that there's no straight cut road to your destiny. You must learn to be flexible. flexible. Blacks, they don't just raise the bar, they are the bar. One thing that I've learned from practicing 43 years and from going on numerous mission trips is that, well, and the mission trips have been locally in state and international. The one thing I saw that's prevalent and pervasive is people want to see. In the international mission, we had stations on uh, dental, medicine, nursing, a whole myriad, but the line, and they started lining up at four o'clock that morning, they wanted to see. In, in gathering this uh, presentation, I thought, let me, let me uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving so swiftly because my time is moving swiftly. I wish I had a little clock that told me how many minutes. But anyway, I just got a few more things, and I know I'm going to be just like my pastor in the closing. This really, uh, th this is the next to the last closing. But there's seven categories of focus that I thought I, that I've discovered that's prevalent, that's needed for in business. First is the uh, focus on ethics and integrity. Next, there's financial and fiscal soundness, skills and training, and as I mentioned earlier, passion, vision, and flexibility. And decent human morality is a prerequisite, I think. And as a believer in business, besides impacting the community, I seek to represent God. And seek is an interesting word. It's one of those vision words. Seek means to see and aim. And lastly, but not least, is to leave a legacy and instead of plan it forward, pray it forward. Are you seeing what I'm saying? I'm reminded of a uh, a gatekeeper at a, my church that uh, more than conquers that has gone on to be with the Lord and he would always say are you hearing what I'm saying and I'm saying to you are you seeing what I'm saying what I've learned to do is learn from the past look to the future but live in the now now is all you have and, and in my days, and this, you may not be able to relate to it, millennials and Gen Zs, but yesterday was a council check. The future is a promissory note, but the now is cash at hand. Be upward sighted and forward focused. And what I mean by upward sighted is to seek See and aim God and his righteousness and all, all these other things will be added. If not initially, then eventually. See, my talent is optometry, but my gifting is vision. The way optometry was introduced to me was divinely orchestrated. A biology teacher at um, Dillard University, my HBCU alma mater, go Dillard, 
had a brochure about optometry, and it caught my eyes. I had never been to an optometry, had never heard of it, but God, by his divine providence, put it for, before me, and I decided at that day, I decree, decree, I know now, I didn't know then, I decreed and declared what I was going to be. As I see it, for continued favor, you need to be, and I'm just going to be honest, you need to focus on humility. God resists the proud and gives faith and, and gives grace to the humble. And this is the last thing I want to say, I think, perhaps, maybe. In the evolution of my vision, and I had been told about favor, and I was once told that God's favor was better than finance. Now, let me be quite honest. I heard it, but I didn't really believe it. But through my evolution process, I know it to be true. But what God also told me, you can have them both, favor and finance. So in conclusion, being in business, you may be the CEO, the head of your business, but in my estimation, in my summation, God is my CEO. And I believe that's why I've been blessed to endure, to thrive in 43 years. Even when I was an unwilling participant in the civil unrest. But I was told by a man of God. If your reaction is godly, God can turn it around. So I say to anyone in business, anyone thinking about being in business, anyone in life, seek, which is a vision word, see and aim Christ and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. Thank you for giving me something that I cannot give back to you, and that's your time. Hello, MTC Church family. My name is Dewana Thompson, and I'm so honored to be with you today as we talk about and celebrate the rich legacy of Black History Month. I am the president and CEO of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and in that role, I have the honor of preserving the legacy and the history of the Birmingham uh, Civil Rights Movement uh, and its impact on the greater movement for civil rights uh, across the country and again, and again across the world. And so I want to first just thank Pastor Green and Ms. D for the opportunity and the leadership of our church for understanding that this is a critical opportunity for us uh, to be joined going together um, as a great, great crowd of witnesses. Um, I went to uh, undergrad at Berea College, and why I'm bringing that up is because Carter G. Woodson, who was the actual founder of what was then Black History Week, is um, credited to be the founder of Black History Month as well. And so I feel a kindred spirit uh, with Carter G. Woodson even today. Um, he I was reading The Miseducation of the Negro, which is probably the most profound book that many would say that he wrote. And so much of what he wrote in that book is still relevant to um, sort of what we are dealing with as uh, a, a people of color, as, as individuals who were brought uh, to this country, many of us, uh, a vast majority of us, um, in, in, a, in a form of slavery. And so he talks a lot about how um, the effects of our proximity to leadership, our proximity to poverty, our proximity to different things has an impact, if you will, on how we grew, what, what made us resilient, what made us brilliant as individuals. And I like to think that that correlates a lot with what we know to be true, what the scripture says. It says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So it's so important that we take these moments to not just 
celebrate and not just have a moment where we can say, oh, yeah, we, we, we're thankful for the Martin Luther King Jr.'s and we're thankful for the Harriet Tubman's, but really to dig a little bit into why our history as a people is so important, why it's important that we bring those, um, the ideas, the, the brilliance, all the different things that came out of a place perhaps of tragedy, but we know that we've seen much triumph over the years. If you did not know, we are actually sitting in the 60th anniversary of the civil rights movement. In 1963, so many pivotal moments happened, um, not just here in the city of Birmingham, but all over the world as it relates to moving the civil rights movement. You might ask, what all happened that year? Well, one of the, the first and most important things that happened in 1963 was the Children's Crusade. Many of you may have referenced it as the Children's March. If you haven't heard of this before, this is when the children of the city of Birmingham, um, essentially what was going on is Martin Luther King Jr. had come to Birmingham, uh, Ralph Albernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, and tensions were very, very high. As you probably know, there were sit-ins, there were um, all kinds of bombings that had happened, um, and quite frankly, people were beginning to think that this process of nonviolence, this movement, if you will, this cry for justice and equality was causing too much of an impact to our communities, putting us in too much way of harm. And so the elders, if you will, who were really only about 25, 26, 27, I love telling that because people think of these individuals as if they were 60, 70, 80 years old, but these were young people, um, powerful in their understanding, powerful in their conviction. And, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was 28 years old. And so at the time of all of this going on and so when you think about it the fact that they were saying yeah this might we might need to sit down we might need to think of a new strategy and there was a call to sort of stop what was happening as it relates to um, the outcry and in 16th Street Baptist Church there was a they were having a mass meeting. Um, I, I like to think that we should still have some mass meetings. I know on Sundays, you know, that is us coming together, but that's not a meeting. That is for us to be here and to be on one accord with the Lord. And it's a time, it is a meeting in the sense of we are meeting God here to get direction. And during the civil rights movement, they would have mass meetings in church and it would be filled with the spirit, it'd be filled with music, but it would also be filled with strategy. Also be a time for them to come together and figure out how are we going to um, attack or move in a certain way? Let's get on one accord um, and let's root that in some sort of shared experience. And so at this particular mass meeting at 16th Street Baptist Church, there was major concern that, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. needed to go back home, <laughs> that, that there was too much being um, put on the citizens of Birmingham to try to carry. And in that conversation, the youth actually stood up and said, we believe that we should still move forward. So much so that they organized with Fred Shuttlesworth, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, a student mass um, exodus. And so Shelly Stewart, who many of you know is still with us today, was a radio DJ at the time. And he gave the code, the code that everyone heard at, in their schools. And f over 5,000 students walked out of their classrooms in protest of segregation, in protest of not having voting rights, in protest of the, the, the police brutality. And that um, image, that um, because when, when they marched out, they were met with brute force, and most of them were taken to jail. And that image, that moment, it signaled something different to Washington, D.C. It signaled something different to national and local leadership that, okay, we cannot turn an eye to what is going on in Birmingham. Shortly thereafter, you have Martin Luther King Jr. writes his letter from the Birmingham jail, which I think is important for us to, to, to note that in that letter, Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't calling out his enemies. He was calling out his friends, his comrades, those who work with him in the, in, the, in the work of the Lord. And he was saying, because people had been telling him, maybe we should slow down. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, be so um, quick to, go, to, to, to move forward in this way. And he was telling them that the time for justice is right now, that we don't have any more time. And that... Um, 
he was calling them into conversation around how they should also be activated. Um, and so you had that specific ha thing happen in 1963. Also in 1963, you had the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, where we all know that the four little girls lost their lives in that bombing. And we know that that shifted the conversation for the, for the nation as well. What many people may not know is that while those four young ladies did lose their life and their fifth young lady, Miss Sarah, was also impacted, two young black boys were also assassinated that day. Why do we never hear their names? Many people, you know, when we talk about it at the Civil Rights Institute, most people have no idea that there were two young black men who also lost their lives that day to vigilante justice. And I think that, you know, I try to share with people that narrative um, is a very interesting thing. And telling our own stories and not allowing other people to tell our stories is so important. It's why we read the Bible. It is why he said, I will leave you something so that you understand how to deal with other things. It's the story. It's the parables. Why the parables? So that we have something to reflect on as we are thinking about the things that we are going through. Well, learning our history, understanding the narrative, understanding what happened, it is so that we can think about what we are going through right now and figure out what are the strategies, what are the opportunities, what are the ways that we can move forward. And so I always bring up those two young black men because the idea at that time was that the, the telling their story would not be as impactful as telling the story of just the four little girls. And so in a, in a lot of ways, they were erased from that moment. And we still see moments where members of our community, um, their impact, their suffering, what they went through might be erased for the greater good. And I always believe that we can tell the whole story. We have to tell the whole story so that individuals can see themselves as a part of the solution, can see themselves as a part of how we move forward. And so, you know, the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing was in one of the most horrific um, uh, uh, plights that we went through as a, as a black community in the city of Birmingham, but it did shift the conversation. It did shift the narrative. It made our um, allies who might have been white, Jewish, um, any other allies that we had, it actually made them have to, to ask themselves a question. Can we stomach this? Can we, can we stand with this? What else happens in 1963? Well, the historic March on Washington happens in 1963. Now, I always like to say, know the history. Don't just say, oh, it was the March on Washington and people came together and Martin Luther King Jr. gave this incredible speech. What you need to understand is, first of all, it wasn't the March on Washington. It was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. That is so incredibly important because when people ask me even today, why do we harp on or why are we still talking about some of the, the, the history and, you know, we need to move forward and why, why is it important for us to go back and sort of watch some of these sad movies and, you know, different things. And I understand because not all of our history is pretty. But guess what? Not everything that got us to salvation is pretty. It was some bloody things that happened. It was some things that happened for our good and that we benefit from now as believers and as Christians. But Christ had to go through some things. The lineage of Christ had to go through some things. And we have, as a people, gone through some things. And so it is important for us to understand those things. Why is it important for me to say March on Washington for jobs and freedom? Because what most people fail to understand is that at the nearing the time that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, he had begun to talk more about um, not just civil rights or not, I would say, social justice. He really had begun to move to economic justice. And why is this important to note? Because he understood, and not only Martin Luther King Jr., but so many of um, the, the movement leaders of that time, whether they were Black Panthers, whether they were indifferent, um, uh, whether they were in SNCC, whether they were in SELC, uh, whether they were in the... Um, um, Alabama Christian Coalition, they all have begun to understand the relationship between being able to financially take care of yourself and your family and what it means to be free. You cannot have civil rights and social justice without having the ability to take care of your families. And we are still having that conversation right now. We are still having a conversation about equity. It's not enough to have equality. Why? Because equality says 
and I love to just remind everybody about this. Equality says that everybody, you know, has access. Well, if I started further back than you do, you start, you telling me I have access to something doesn't actually put me in the predicament or in the best place to actually be able to obtain that thing. Equity says everybody starts with the same thing. Everybody starts at the same level. Everybody has access to the same resources. And then it is definitely upon you and your family and your you know, community to push for the things that you need. And so I always say that the March on Washington for jobs and freedom it was um, important for us to understand all of the messages that were coming across the stage that day. It was a conversation on health care, a, a conversation on education, a conversation on um, economics. It was a conversation, yes, on social, uh, civil rights and social justice and um, a conversation on police brutality, a conversation on uh, voting rights. And we even see that today we are still right now fighting for um, greater access at the polls, greater access for political participation, greater access for resources coming into our community so that we can address things like food deserts, um, inadequacies and disparities in health care and in housing. These are things that they were talking about in 1963. And you know, so it is important for us to understand that Black History Month just isn't a month where we get to feel good or a month where we get to, you know, reflect. It really is a month where we should be coming together and asking hard questions. It is a month where we should, yes, celebrate um, the, the the triumphs that we've had, um, the things that we have endured, the 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 legacy, the rich legacy and history that we have. All of the inventors, all of the educators, all of the uh, activists, all of the entertainers, all of the, uh, what we would like to now say, our culture that we absolutely know has impacted the very fabric of the United States of America and indeed the world. One of the things that I've learned um, and continuously learned as the president of the Civil Rights Institute is that what we did in Birmingham, even what we are still doing in Birmingham, Countries across the world took those examples and began to embed it in their practices for social justice and civil rights and human rights. We saw that uh, with Nelson Mandela and apartheid. We saw that in Sudan. We saw that with the Chinese tenants. We saw that in so many different ways. And so we know that what we do here absolutely can have an impact on what is happening worldwide. Now, MTC, that should be no strange thing to you because our mission says that we are a church, that a ministry that is reaching this city and the world for the Lord. So how do we reach the city and the world? We have to embed our faith in the way in which we show up um, every single day. So I believe, yes, that when I go to the, to the Civil Rights Institute, that I am there planted with a faith lens for a very real situation, a faith lens for a, for a human rights situation, a faith lens for a social justice situation. I am doing the work of the ministry through the opportunities that God has afforded me. And I know that this is um, where I'm supposed to be. And I challenge us to understand how do we push the work of the ministry or how do we advocate our faith lens through the the systems that God has allowed us to be a part of. Um, this is just my system, but you may be a nurse, you may be an educator, you may be a singer, whatever those spaces are, there is a unique opportunity for you to take um, not just your black culture, but your culture of faith with you and impact um, that community, that audience, that group of people that you have um, influence with. And so, you know, God has blessed me. I never really thought that I would be in the predict uh, that I would be where I am now at the Civil Rights Institute because it was never on my trajectory. But how many, you know, we're so glad that God knows he he is the one that plans our path. And so but when I look back and I started, I wish Tony was here. As I look back, there are moments where I'm like, wow, God, you already knew this. I have met and worked with so many civil rights leaders over my over my tenure. And I didn't even realize I 
sat with Coretta Scott King. I sat with Harry Belafonte, Congressman John Lewis, Abraham Woods, and Bishop Woods. I've sat with Dorothy Height. I sat with Bell Hooks. I sat with Angela Davis. These are individuals who, um, because of the benefit of their wisdom and the benefit of their experience and the benefit of places where they missed the mark, I have been able to um, take from their wisdom and craft my own thoughts around how we move social justice, how we move human rights, and uh, what do we do as it relates to standing up um, for, for others and the freedom of others. And so I encourage you, um, again, to listen to all of those who are coming today and showing you what black history has meant in the different spaces to understand that we do have a rich legacy as people of color, we do have um, um, just a, a an incredible story that is still being told, right? We don't. We I love to say at the Civil Rights Institute, yes, we start people with going through what happened, but we stop. We we once they go through the museum part, we then ask them, what can we do now? What is it that we can be doing together to make sure that some of these things never happen again? And that's where the opportunity is. The opportunity. Is is always where the work started, where it's going, and where it can go. And so I believe that as a people, we have an incredible responsibility to what this country looks like, to what um, justice looks like in this country. Black History Month is an opportunity for us to celebrate. It is an opportunity for us to, um, to feel connected, to feel a sense of pride, to feel a sense of belonging, but it is also an opportunity for us to feel a sense of urgency around what the things that we know are are incredibly important for our community. I'm so glad that I could be with you today. Again, thank you so much to Pastor Green and Ms. D and the leadership of, MC, of our church for making sure that we take these moments that, because they are critical and they indeed allow us to move forward uh, with in purpose um, and, and not in purpose, but on purpose. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm George W. Stewart a member of the More Than Conquerors Faith Church under the leadership of Pastor and Apostle Stephen Green. It's a, an honor for me to share this tidbit about African Americans in uh, the entertainment world. Uh, I started out in Tuscaloosa, Alabama as a radio announcer and um, went from there uh, simultaneously a writer as a young kid, writing songs and writing books and dibbling and dabbling and writing plays and it was something that was on the inside of me that just kept me stirred about how to entertain people, how to provide some joy, how to provide some happiness through gifts. And as African Americans, I believe we've done that for quite some time. I just know as I was thinking and meditating on this, that sometimes adversity brings out the uh, creative uh, juices in you because you have to find a way to um, entertain. You have to find a way to find joy in the midst of uh, sadness, in the midst of darkness. You have to find a way to uh, get through the day. And that's what uh, I've found as I've researched and as, I, as I've experienced that African Americans, we have had to uh, be able to sing in the midst of uh, hot sun, chopping cotton, uh, being able to sing when things look like laws and all of these challenges were against African Americans. We've had to get through the day, I call it. So we found ourselves being creative, being creative. You go back to the 1800s and you had the minstrel shows. And these shows were, and of course, this, um, not just starting in the 1800s, of course, but bringing all of uh, these different uh, type of entertainment entities, dancing and singing, was brought over from Africa uh, because, uh, for instance, um, dance. Dance was a sense of uh, celebrating the birth of a baby, marriage. Anytime something happened that there should be a celebration, there were different dances that were attached to these things. So when our people came to America, they brought that dance. And uh, although... Um, the slave owners didn't want African Americans to dance. Uh, they called it any time you lift up off your lift your feet up off the floor. That was dancing. They banned that. They banned a lot of the instruments 
But what happened was the creativity, the ingenuity of our forefathers, they began to shuffle their feet instead of dance and created a dance out of shuffling their feet. That's interesting because once it's on the inside, whatever you're created to do, you'll find a way to do it. Uh, the singing, they were not able to sing, I'm talking about slaves now, singing their songs, so they began to use songs as cold songs, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. Uh, these were songs that were encouraging the people, giving music and signs of how to move around and how to survive. That's the, diff, that's the big, big piece there is how to survive. How not only to survive, but to thrive. I want to put a little note here and say that um, sometimes when you see something, if you're creative, you see how it can be different. You see how it can be more attractive. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, we kind of chuckle when we see African Americans in different areas of entertainment, sports, uh, when you talk about acting, uh, you could talk about uh, all the other different areas, whether it's poetry. Uh, if you talk about these areas, you find out it can be the basics of it. What am I talking about? Basketball. Basketball was a two-hand sport. It was a pretty much throw the ball. James A. Naismith would throw the ball here, throw the ball there. But around uh, the early 1920s, mid-1920s, uh, Abe Saberstein came along, uh, a Jewish gentleman, and he uh, organized or facilitated the Harlem Globetrotters. Well, the Harlem Globetrotters were strictly, although they were skilled back basketball players, we call it, they put a little something with it. Uh, the behind-the-back dribble, the dunking the ball, uh, they created the point guard and the forward. It was a basic sport before that. But then blacks were involved, and you start seeing more entertainment, a little more something-something put with it. So you see blacks in there, you know, um, involved in it. It elevated the whole entertainment value because, you know, it's kind of boring when you're just throwing the ball from one person to the other and finally shooting the ball. It's more interesting when a guy comes down the court, dribbles behind his back, does a crossover, the 360. So blacks were involved in elevating the entertainment value of basketball. Now, let's go on to the dancing. Man, creating dances like the Charleston back in uh, the Roaring Twenties time. The Charleston was one of the dances that were uh, created, uh, given credit by African Americans and bringing it to the forefront. And a very special note for those of us in Alabama, you've heard of the dance called the Twist. And if you are from uh, the 60s, uh, you know about the twist, Chubby Checker, Chubby Checker. Well, an interesting note many may not know is that song, the song The Twist was actually recorded first by someone from Bessemer, Alabama. That's right, a gentleman named Hank Ballard. He um, created that, uh, that craze, that twist craze. Come on, baby, let's do the twist. And, of course, many of you probably have done the twist. You probably still can do it a little bit, uh, just a little bit. You might have to do it sitting down, but you can, you can still do the twist. Come on, baby, let's do the twist. <laughs> well, Hank Ballard recorded that song first, and Hank Ballard was from uh, Bessemer. He grew up in Bessemer, Alabama. He recorded it on the backside, but the other historical piece of that is Hank Ballard had some kind of risque type songs, a uh, career. Uh, he did a song called Annie Had a Baby, so they needed to make it more appealing to the general marketplace. And what they did was they gave that song to Chubby Checker. And another interesting fact while we're talking about this, you've heard of uh, Fats Domino. There's a thrill on the heel. Well, Fats Domino was a keyboard player somewhere around New Orleans, I think he was based out of. But um, so you had uh, Chubby Checker and you had Fats Domino. Well, you had Fats Domino first, so they created another entity, if you will, created an image, Chubby Checker. You get it? Fats Domino, and then they created Chubby Checker. That's interesting to me because uh, the entertainment business is about creating images. 
The entertainment business is multi-billion dollar in its gross of income, multi-billion dollars. If you saw uh, the recent um, um, Super Bowl, you saw Rihanna out there. She's a billionaire. So, uh, and people, pretty much the, the, the logic behind that is if you don't like just the entertainment value of football, guess what happens? We're going to put Rihanna in. It's halftime. We're going for everybody. We're going for people who like the entertainment uh, football, and then we like the entertainment of the halftime show with the music. Now, entertainment and football. What happens, and it's a little bit less than it used to be, but when blacks were involved, Billy White Shoes Johnson, he had a dance, the icky shuffle. You know, all of that is entertainment. If you don't like football, you're looking to see how are they going to be creative to dance in the end zone. You want to see sometimes how they wear their uniforms. Um, the Fab Five of Michigan, they came along and added an entertainment value, which continued now from the Harlem Globetrotters who put, like I said, the dunk in uh, the NBA or the ABA at that time. When you had Dr. J coming along, even the hairstyles, the hairstyles are a little different now, but back there they had the big afros. All of that is entertainment. Um, so if you don't like just the sports, Don King was great at that. He decided if you don't like boxing, let me make it an event, an entertaining, entertaining event rather than just boxing. People don't want to watch uh, two individuals in the ring just blooding each other. But guess what? It was a whole event. When they did the Thrill in Manila, they took artists over there like uh, the Spinners and James Brown and I think B.B. King was involved. So they made it a whole event of entertainment. Entertainment brings us joy. Entertainment allows us to escape out of uh, our trials and our tribulations. Entertainment allows us to kind of uh, get away for a moment in our minds and see something that will cause us to laugh, will cause us to dance, will cause us to clap our hands. And African Americans, blacks, have done that for the American society. I want to bring it to Birmingham again. Uh, Birmingham had the first coined sound. And you say, well, George, what does that mean? Well, you know the Motown sound, you know the Philly International sound with people, Philly International sound with people like who, uh, the OJs and people like uh, the Delphonics, um, you know, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff created that sound. And Motown, of course, was Mr. Barry Gordy, who uh, created music with the Temptations, Supreme, Smokey Robinson, and on and on. Well, Birmingham had the first coined sound. And that sound was called the Jefferson County Sound. And it was uh, quartet singers, gospel quartet singers, who sang uh, a cappella for the most part. And this happened in the 1920s. And it was, this sound was created, um, influenced by the Fisk Jubilee Singers out of Fisk University or Fisk Institute at that time in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, also, the uh, Tuskegee Institute Singers and the Hampton Institute singers. And these were pretty much singers on the campus who um, they were created to raise funds and to promote the school. Well, if you can imagine that choir being on campus, it's somewhat like the Echoes of Faith uh, that were the foundation of More Than Conquerors Faith Church under the leadership of Dwayne Davis. At that time, that choir was uh, a school choir but it influenced the whole community, the whole region. Well, by the time those singers got to Tuskegee, they raised a lot of money. It said in the 1900s, they raised over a million dollars, the Fisk Jubilee Singers. So, of course, uh, Dr. Booker T. Washington said, let's do the same thing at Tuskegee. So what they did was they put those singers together. They were successful. But the people living within the community of Tuskegee began to say, let's see if we can... Uh, emulate, imitate, if you will, the sound that we hear these uh, collegially trained singers. And they said, we'll do it within our communities 
thusly creating smaller groups called quartets. With the great migration to Birmingham, the industrialization of this region, Jefferson County, these people began to come to Birmingham. Uh, names like Mr. Silas Steele, um, R.C. Foster, people of that nature, they came to Birmingham and started training individuals throughout the community. I'm talking about influencing the world, and this will probably be my last uh, reference to how blacks have influenced entertainment. Uh, and I do this because we have been involved with uh, quartet singers for quite some time, founding the American Gospel Quartet Convention uh, over 31 years ago. So they migrated to Birmingham. When they got to Birmingham, they started going into each community to train groups, and they were very, very good, very good. And the sound, uh, the Jefferson County sound, the way it's so distinct is that before that, the sounds were even kind of like barber, barbershop quartets. Well, African Americans putting a little extra something, something with it, started um, adding a little ad lib to it. A little, before that, it was just even songs. But then the African Americans started doing what was called a second lead, ad libbing. And those barbershop, I mean, those um, singers were all over the place. They had the Inslee Jubilees, you had the Shelby County Big Four, uh, on and on, the Fairfield Four. You had all of these songs, uh, all these groups, rather. And here's an interesting thing. You started having males and females who were singing. You're talking about the 1920s, and they developed the Jefferson County sound. It was so popular until groups began to imitate them all over the country. And these groups, even though they weren't from Jefferson County, they would sometimes stretch the truth for a little extra added prestige and say they were from Jefferson County. There weren't any uh, recording studios here, but they would, these groups would go to Atlanta from Jefferson County record, and it's awesome. History will record it. So look it up, Google it. Now, here's what's happening. Um, that was in the 20s. These groups would go all across the country, and sometimes they couldn't come back home. And not that they couldn't, but because of different things, like the groups would break up, some would find uh, their wives, if you will, there, and they'd stay in those locations and begin to train. These groups, these quartets, influenced groups all over the world. If you go particularly to Europe, you're going to find that African Americans from Jefferson County influenced groups all over the world. One particular group was called the Harmonettes later on, like in the 50s, and many know the group as Dorothy Lovecoats and the original gospel Harmonettes. Well, they had a lady who, her name was Miss Vera Cobb. If you Google Vera Cobb, V-E-R-A, last name K-O-L-B, and Little Richard, you will find that Little Richard attributes his success and his style to Miss Vera Cobb. That's right, the one who says he was the originator, nobody could duplicate him. Little Richard was inspired by Miss Vera Cobb from Birmingham, Alabama. Yes, and here's the piece I'm really trying to get to. Um, the late uh, Bishop Kevin Turner, when I shared this information, he did some work at the University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, studying this. He called it the King Soprano, and that's that little swirl you hear. Woo! Well, Miss Vera Cobb did that in the original Gospel Harmonettes and others who followed her, like Cleo Kennedy. But the up and coming artists all over the country would add that to their singing. One particular who, group who did it were the Isley Brothers, one of the most influential groups of all time. They did a song called Twist and Shout. Twist and shout, and if you hear twist and shout, and they'll go, woo, well, they got it right from here in Birmingham and the original gospel harmonettes. Well, the Beatles recorded during what we call uh, the British boys coming across the pond. Then uh, the Beatles re recorded, um, they recorded the song uh, Twist and Shout. And when they did that, they added the swirl, that King Soprano sound. And then what happened was, it became a part of all of their singing. They did uh, She Loved Me, Yeah, 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 and they did the whoo. Well, Jefferson County, you can be proud to know that you influenced 
the world. And quartets uh, who originated, um, Paul Williams, his uncles were the Inslee Jubilees, used to record in the barbershop or sing, uh, rehearse in the barbershop. Eddie Kendrick, Temptations, Bobby Womack came out of a quartet and they became the Valentinos and they influenced greatly the world. All of the people, Lou Rawls was in a group called the Pilgrim Travelers. Of course, Sam Cooke was with the Soul Stirs. So entertainment from acting, dancing, fashions, uh, sports, you name it all. We've had some great people uh, who influenced the world. And without that influence, take that out and there'll be a blank spot that we will all be uh, dull. But because of the input and impact of African Americans in entertainment. And it, it would take all day and several weeks to even scratch the surface to call the great names. But those are just a little tidbits. And so we salute all of those African Americans who made their contributions in times when times were hard, but they didn't stop creating. Mahalia Jackson in the gospel world and all of those wonderful people, we appreciate them and we're awesomely glad and thankful to salute African Americans in entertainment. Well, there you have it, my friend. Tremendous information there as we're doing a, a, a Black History special, celebrating Black History as all of the world is doing. We're calling it uh, the uh, uh, Glorious History and Feast of the Black Race. Amen. And I thank you for our presenters. I made a big mistake there. I got to going so much. I, I don't know how I forgot one of my most favorite doctors and preachers and, and uh, servants and believers, Dr. Jackie Stewart. Doc, I call Dr. J, Dr. J. Uh, you know, uh, she ain't going to uh, upscale in, uh, her husband there, but she'll be in this segment. Matter of fact, we're going to start with her first. Dr. Jackie has been in ministry, uh, in business, in medicine, pediatrician for years. So she's seen a lot of the evolution of what happens with uh, doctors and nurses and some of the things and places that we're accepted in her glorious business of hugs and kisses and, and all that she does, a man with Magnolia Pediatrics. So, hey, my bad, my bad, Dr. J. I won't call Dr. J. Dr. J, you know Dr. J. I don't want to get ahead of Carrie here talking about, you know, Dr. J back in the day with the ABA League and all that. But that's the real doctor, they, doc, Dr. Jackie St do it. Amen. She's a part of this team too. So, um, so you know, it's going to get good. Matter of fact, we're going to start with her, Dr. Stewart talking about blacks and medicine. And then of course we'll go uh, in the regular order that I had announced and we'll just uh, watch them wax eloqu eloquent. And I'll come back once Cadillia gets through and we'll uh, do some anointing and uh, release some, what I call 21st century freedom. I won't download the anointing where you've been oppressed now, but not with the same things like Bull Connor and and you know uh, uh, the dogs and the fire hoses. We gon' we gon' let the, who let the dogs out? We gon' let Caleb out, which means a poor dog. <laughs> uh, that kind of and the fire of God is going to be causing us to be on fire to do what we need to do. So without any further delay, let's start with Dr. Jacqueline Stewart. She's the owner and proprietor of uh, Hugs and Kisses and Magnolia uh, Pediatrician Pediatrics. Praise the Lord. I'm Dr. Jacqueline W. Stewart, a pediatrician here in Birmingham, Alabama, and a member of More Than Conquerors Faith Church. I am just so happy to be with you today to talk about a little bit about black history and particularly uh, blacks in medicine. Uh, that is my field and a field that I'm very proud of. I finished the University of Alabama here in Birmingham after uh, my bachelor's degree at Tuskegee. But uh, many of you already know about um, such uh, peoples as uh, Dr. Daniel Hale, who, was a, who did the first successful open heart surgery. Uh, he was um, uh, very successful in his career as a cardi cardiovascular surgeon. And uh, he also started the first black-owned uh, hospital. It was Providence Hospital in Washington, D.C., and it was the first uh, hospital that was owned by blacks, and it also taught nurses, uh, which was an interesting situation because the nurses got uh, the influence and the experience in the hospital itself. And then there was Dr. Charles Drew, 
uh, many of us have heard uh, that uh, he pioneered in blood banking, a situation that uh, was very useful and very life-saving during World War II when he uh, uh, developed a system that would bank the blood so that the troops on the field uh, would have the availability of blood to be transfused when they were injured, which cer certainly saved a lot of uh, uh, casualties that would have been uh, during World War II uh, when there was blood available in the, the field of battle. Ironically, it is oftentimes er erroneously stated that Dr. Drew died after a car accident when he was refused blood, but this was not true. One of those that was in the car with him said that it was not true and that uh, the, whatever uh, the injuries were, they were so severe that not even a blood transfusion would have saved him. Other uh, notable uh, doctors of, of, of color that uh, serviced our country and the world, uh, the Health and Human Services, uh, Dr. David Thatcher, Thatcher, uh, who was uh, a surgeon uh, that served in Health and Human Services, that division and cabinet of uh, the United States. Louis Sullivan also served as, uh, 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 in that capacity. Dr. Jocelyn Elders uh, was the first African American and the second female to serve as Surgeon General in the United States. Uh, so we're very proud of what Dr. Elder did. But we also know that uh, Dr. Regina Benjamin uh, also served as um, a member of that ca of a cabinet for um, the uh, the United States, as far as Surgeon General was concerned. I am very proud of the history of blacks in medicine, but I'm most proud of the history of blacks in medicine here in Birmingham, Alabama. As we look back at the history of medicine in Birmingham, Alabama, we look back uh, to uh, the University of Alabama uh, that uh, in the year of um, 1964, um, when the University of Alabama School of Medicine admitted their first black students. And those were Dr. Richard Dale and Dr. Samuel L. Sullivan. Dr. Richard Dale and Dr. Sullivan both attended uh, Parker High School. They were in the same graduating class. They also attended Howard University. They were roommates at Howard University, and they served uh, our community here in Birmingham. But they were the first blacks to graduate from the University of Alabama here in Birmingham School of Medicine. Um, and we're very proud of, of them making a sacrifice for the rest of us. I must say that the first black female that was admitted to the School of Medicine was Dr. Patience Claiborne, who also attended Tuskegee University and was a psychiatrist for many years here in the Birmingham area. The second black female uh, was Dr. Sandra Lewis, who served uh, University Hospital uh, as an anesthesiologist. And praise God, I was the third black female to finish the University of Alabama School of Medicine. So we are very proud of our local contributors uh, to the history of medicine in these United States uh, and to the world through our service to, uh, at the University of Alabama and the city of Birmingham. We're proud of all of our doctors, our black physicians. We have come from a very few when I started uh, back in 1976, uh, to many that are now uh, in several areas of medicine. Cer several of the subspecialties are being filled with African-American physicians that are not only from African-American medical schools, but all over the United States. Uh, we are so proud of the ones that we serve here uh, at More Than Conquerors, Dr. Sandra Ford, uh, 
and uh, Dr. Um, Wanaki Adams and, and uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Carolyn Johnson. We're so proud of them, and we know that uh, our, our future is in good hands and that the future of medicine here in the United States and particularly Alabama and the, the city of Birmingham is in good shape. So we just thank God for the vision. We thank God for giving us the knowledge, the wherewithal, and the opportunity to serve his people and to serve in the field of medicine. Now, we just want to um, give God praise for healing. We thank him for his son, Jesus, that went to the cross and shed his blood that we might be able to heal. You know, when Jesus was here on earth, even when he was ready to heal, he did. He made sure that there was work that was done by the one to be healed. With the blind man, he told he spat on the ground and he told him to take the mud and wipe it in his eyes and he would be healed. With the lame man, he told him to pick up his bed and walk. So he always gives us the wherewithal for healing. And we just thank God for uh, the, the blood of Jesus that helps us in our work and gives us the power to heal. Now, as we go before the throne, we thank you, Lord God, for your healing mercies. We thank you for the stripes that were taken by your son, Jesus, that allows us the, uh, the ability to heal, that allows us the ability to overcome sickness and pain, that allows us the ability, Lord God, to ease disease, Lord God, to, that allows us the knowledge, the wisdom, and the wherewithal, for the, all the, the necessary things that you have put in this earth that will allow us to heal, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for those this evening that serve in the capacity of healing, Lord God. We thank you for their dedication. We thank you for their knowledge. We thank you, Lord God, for their wisdom, Lord God, and we thank you for the anointing of healing that's on each and every one of our lives. Father God, we just glorify you and give you all the honor and the praise, Lord God, that you have given us the wherewithal to heal. You said, let the sick among you call for the elders. And uh, we thank you, Lord God, that there are elders in the midst of us that have the, the gift of healing in their spirits and in their hands, Lord, and we glorify you as always, Lord God, as we uh, come before you, we want to thank you for all that you do, for all that you have done, Lord God, and most of all, for what, all that you will do. Now, teach us how to receive all these blessings and teach us, Lord, how to give them back out. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. As we continue this journey about our glorious history and feats of the black race, my name is Kerry Knapper, and I'm here to talk to you about sports. Now, many of you may be thinking that sports isn't quite as important as some of the other topics that we have because we're going to have people that are going to talk about life-changing medical breakthroughs. We're going to talk about African-Americans that helped us get to right to vote and expanded our rights and our privileges within this country. And sports just kind of ranks way low on the demographics of that. But I, I disagree. And I'm going to tell you why I disagree. Why is sports important? Because we live in a sports-dominated society. Of the 330 million people in this country, 200 million of them annually watch the Super Bowl. That shows you how important sports is in America. Now, for a long time, America has used sports as a punitive measure to let African Americans know where they stand or don't stand in society. Now, like much of society, professional American sports were segregated in the first part of the 20th century, preventing black athletes from competing with white athletes on a level playing field. In baseball, there were established Negro Leagues for non-white players while there were predominantly African-Americans, there were also several Latin American players that could actually play 
in Major League Baseball, meaning that you, can, you could be a light-skinned brown person from Cuba or Latin America and play in Major League Baseball, but you couldn't be an American citizen with black skin and play for the New York Yankees or the St. Louis Cardinals. It was against the rules. They wanted to let us know where we stood, which is you're not included. This is why sports is so important, because the, the, we use sports to measure where a race is in certain, in certain parts of society. Now, the National Basketball League officially integrated in 1950. The NFL was completely segregated from 1934 through 1945. Now, however, the NFL and the NBA had very little of the popularity of Major League Baseball from the 30s and 40s. And that's kind of what I want to talk about at the beginning because baseball was the national sport. Baseball was the sole sport that captured the imagination of every sports-loving American. That's why some historians, people gonna disagree with me, but some historians believe that Jackson Roosevelt Robinson is the second most important black person in the civil rights movement next to Martin Luther King. All right? Now, we're going to go back to Jackie Robinson in a minute, but I want to talk about some other people that had impacts on breaking barriers and setting, setting, setting standards in sports that were black people that helped us, helped us get notoriety through sports over time. Now, in boxing in 1908, Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. However, his brazen lifestyle and fondness for, shall we say, women not of his race, not only got him arrested, but they stripped the title from him. Imagine that. He, liked, he had a white girlfriend, so they took the title from him and put him in jail. If that was the rules today, half the NFL would be in jail. Now, years later, Muhammad Ali... His title was also stripped, but not for those reasons, but this time for refusing to fight in the Vietnam War for religious reasons. And the greatest, as he liked to call himself, and many of us believe he to be, he came back and won that title back as soon as he was eligible and then won it again. The only boxer in history to win the title three times. Now in basketball, Bill Russell and Lou Alcindor, before he was named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, paved the way for Michael Jordan and LeBron James. I know there's a big discussion among basketball heads, who's the greatest, LeBron or Michael Jordan. It's Jordan, by the way. But anyway, um, Bill Russell. Bill Russell won 11 titles with the Boston Celtics and two as the first black head coach in the NBA. And, and he did it in the, one of the most racist cities in the America, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. In, in fact, there was an incident that Bill Russell had to deal with. In the midst of his title runs, when he was away on business, some, some, some people broke into his house and defecated on his bed and painted nigger on the walls with that defecation. That's how they treated a man that was winning six basketball titles. That's what he had to deal with. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, in his own right, won six titles before LeBron James just recently eclipsed him as the all-time leading scorer. Now, if you enjoyed Pat Mahomes and Jalen Hurts in the Super Bowl a few, a, few, a few days ago, man, what a game that was. The first Super Bowl with two African-American quarterbacks. But somebody had to pave the way. They need to thank Doug Williams and Warren Moon. Doug Williams is the first-round pick out of Grambling State University in 1978. And at the time, they made him the very lowest paid quarterback in the NFL. It was so low, he just left. He went to the USFL. And he fought his way back to the NFL and 12 years later became the first black quarterback to win Super Bowl 32 and was named the MVP. Warren Moon, despite an illustrious career at the University of Washington and led them to be Rose Bowl champions, in 1977 wasn't even drafted and he had to go and play in the CFL the Canadian Football League and all that snow and he won five championships in six years and that's how he had to prove himself he had to go do that first and then if finally signed with the Houston Oilers 
and became the franchise's all-time leading passer. These are the guys that paved the way for Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts to do what they did and perform so well. Now, before Venus and Serena Williams, the Williams sisters, they won a 37 combined Grand Slams. Those are the major tournaments in tennis. There was a woman named Althea Gibson. She was the first black woman to win a Grand Slam in 1956. That was her first of 11 total. And before the great Tiger Woods won 15 majors in golf, Robert Elder paved the way in 1975 as the first black man to win the Masters. But all this comes back to Jackie Robinson, who opened the door for them all. Not only was Mr. Robinson dazzling on the field, but his demeanor, his intelligence, his dignity, it, he, he, he made white America see black men in a different way. Now I'm gonna say something that's gonna shock you, and this is why I said a lot of historians think Jackie Robinson may have been the second most important person in the civil rights movement. In 1947, think about this, in America, in 1947, they did a poll. Jackie Robinson was the second most popular man in America next to Bean Crosby. White people were starting to see black people different because of the way Jackie Robinson played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He immediately won Rookie of the Year, his first year in the league. Then he won MVP soon after that and led Brooklyn to this world champion, this, his first world championship um, not long into his career. But it wasn't just what he did on the field. He was smart. He was strong. He was brave. He didn't take no mess. He let people know that the quality of his play and the quality of his skill and everything that he could provide and, and, and provide to, to, to Brooklyn is something that a black person can provide to your organization. Now, he, he, he made a vow to Brooks Roberts, not Brooks Roberts, he made a vow to the general manager at the time of the Brooklyn Dodgers that he would not fight back. He would not... He would not get angry. He would not strike back at his enemies, at, at other opponents for two whole years. And they threw at his head. They spiked him in his leg when they ran by first base. They did all of this. And he kept his mouth shut. And, and the toll was heavy. The toll was heavy. When he, re, when he retired in his mid-30s, he looked, he, looked like, he, he looked like a 50 or 60-year-old man. His hair was totally white. And he died very early due to diabetes. The toll was heavy on him. But as a result of the enormity of this man's contribution, the number 42 has been retired throughout the league of Major League Baseball. Now, if you're not familiar with sports, great players get their numbers retired for their team. But baseball said this man went through so much and was so great and was so important. No one on any team will ever wear 42 again. And in fact, every, every season on April the 15th, they call it Jackie Robinson Day. And every team, with every player, they take their own number off and they wear number 42 in honor of that great man. And I thank you for your time. This has been a little walk down history of the dignity and the importance and the impact of black Americans in sports. And I just want you to remember, next time you watch Jalen Hurts or Patrick Mahomes or LeBron James or any of your other favorite players in any sport, just remember, somebody did the hard part to pave the way. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I am Dr. Cordelia Anderson, Associate Professor in Music at the Alabama State University. And I'm here to talk about the history of blacks in music. It's my subject matter that I studied um, as I was studying to get my doctorate. I did a lot of study on spirituals and how music started for black Americans. And music started with us with the Negro spiritual. These were slave songs. And so with these slave songs, 
the, the spirituals were used in three different ways. The first way was through working songs, just them working in the field, just to get the day going. Um, they were also used as code words, which was these were the code words to escape to freedom. And they were also used for worship, which is what you see now in present day in our black churches. And so some of these Negro spirituals, especially the ones for the cold words, they will be codes for them to get to freedom. As we know about Harriet Tubman, her leading a lot of slaves through the Underground Railroad. And they would sing songs like, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. They would sing these songs because it was actually slave cold to say this was going to be our passageway to freedom into the water, into the river. And those rivers, that would happen because um, the slave masters would send dogs out to look for the slaves and they would not catch their scent if they stayed in the water because water river would hide the scent of a person. So that was one of the, the slave um, cold words that they would sing all the time. And so moving forward into that, you have certain groups that became really popular. Um, universities dealing with HBCUs. Fisk University was a big deal during this time. Um, these singers, the Fisk Jubilee singers started around 1871, which was a little bit after the Emancipation Proclamation um, that President Lincoln had signed for all slaves to be free, whether you were in the North or the South. So Fisk Jubilee, we know Fisk University, HBCU, is located in Nashville, Tennessee. And these students, what they did was travel all over the U.S. as well as Europe, singing these spirituals to raise money for their school. Their school was closing. You know, at that time, a lot of black schools and HBCUs and their foundings did not have funding to keep their programs going. And so the Fisk Jubilee Jubilee singers did that for their university. Moving on, as you talk about music, I have so much to talk about um, as music as a grand scheme of thing. I want to talk about some of the instrumentalists who were very um, important during this time. Like a lot of people don't know about Blind Tom Wiggins. He was a pianist. And he composed music. His dates are 1849 to 1908. He was born right out of slavery. He was born a slave. And so he was controlled by his master, but he had this innate ability to play piano. He was born blind and born with autism, with an autistic disability. So that heightened his creative um, side of his nature and how he performed music. Tom's Wiggins, blind Tom Wiggins, actually did a lot of performance me at the White House um, during the time of the early presidents. Um, he did a lot of performing there. But what was so instrumental about it, he was the first black pianist to become a millionaire just based off of his performances. So that was something that's really, you know, prevalent in our time. And it shows the birth of more pianists, more piano players that come through his lineage. Um, moving on, I definitely want to talk about more vocal things and touch on Matilda Ciceretti Jones, who is who I'm wearing on my shirt. She represents black opera. She's the very first black um, soprano to actually sing in the main or on the main stage at Carnegie Hall. Huge honor. At that time, blacks were not even welcome. Um, into the building, let alone perform on the stage. So Ciceretta Jones is very huge, instrumental. She paved the way for singers like Marian Anderson, who was the very first black performer to perform at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. She paved the way for so many um, today's Leotine Price, who is still living at 96 years old and still singing and vocalizing every day to this day. As we move on, 
to talking more about blacks in music, I want to go right into the black church where we deal with gospel music. Gospel music is birthed through the African-American spiritual. So you have here Mr. Thomas A. Dorsey, who is the father of gospel music. This is when music becomes really prevalent in our churches. At this point, Slaves are no longer um, in worship with their masters. They're actually in their own worship services. And so this is how gospel music is birthed during this time. And so the very, very important song that we know that's very popular that Thomas A. Dorsey composes, Precious Lord. You heard that song all throughout the civil rights movement. It was Dr. King's favorite song. And so I want to go ahead and move into the civil rights movement. It was during these times where we're, we're past slavery. We're still singing these songs of upliftment. Also, we're still, we're singing these songs of faith of hope, of worship. As I said earlier, the Afro-American spiritual was also used for worship. So we were thankful people. We were thankful unto God that he has gotten us through slavery on into us having our own lives, having our own families, building revenue, building community. And now we're faced with the civil rights, the civil rights movement where we as blacks don't have the same rights. We don't have the right to vote. We don't have the right to sit at the same restaurants or be in the same churches. So this is during the time where the protests were happening. Birmingham, right here in the heart of the Magic City, where were some of the main protests. And some of those protests carry songs, these spirituals that turned into freedom songs. Songs such as, and protest songs, such as, oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. They were marched through our southern cities singing these songs, singing this song of protest because we want freedom now to be able to do the same thing that white Americans are doing within our communities, um, owning property, um, having our own churches, building our churches, building our foundation, building our education system. So these are some of the things that music played a humongous part in the growth of the black movement, how the blacks moved from the spiritual, from slavery, all the way to the civil rights movement, all the way to now in the black church. We have free worship now in our churches and our choirs, and we're growing up our kids into this legacy of learning black music, how it started, and how we are to continue it into our future. So that is the history of black Americans and black music. I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you. All right. There you have it, my friend, uh, Dr. Cadelia. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Cadelia. I'm about to call Dr. Stewart, but she's a doctor with a doctorate in music. Well, I got a doctorate in music, too. I just doctor when music and God doctor on my music. <laughs> Sometimes it seems it comes out like a, <laughs> like it's a little sick, but that's all right. But the knowing is in it. Can't do it like Adelia does it, amen. But I'm going to sing something. You know I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. She sings because she's able. She sings because she's skilled, amen. And she's a trainer. Thank you. She works feverishly. She grew up here at Boiling Congress Faith Church. And Carrie Napper, he's just a walking history of God. If you want to know any stats, past, present, and future, when we talk, he's, I mean, he does with the, uh, with the history of what you see me doing. With, with scriptures, man, Kerry Napper, amen, and all the rest of the presenters that went before us there, Cadelia and Dr. Stewart, and, and just all of them just waxing uh, eloquent. Uh, we're proud of each one of them that, that made presentations. Now, uh, as I get ready to close, you know, the Bible says, he whom the Son sets free. Thank you to all of them. Matter of fact, the way I can describe all our team that just ministered, all of them are part of more than conquerors. We could have gone outside the city and invited any of our friends like Larry Thornton at McDonald's or Dr. Richard Arrington and uh, Shelly Stewart. You know what I'm saying? Uh, people that uh, we've seen around that have done tremendous things down through the years. Right here before our very eyes. You don't have to go very far. 
And you see the new things that uh, God is using. Some of our people like Trinity uh, uh, in years past and Mike McClure and how God's blowing him up. And so God's raising up uh, uh, Rubens and we can go on and on and on and the Veneta Flowers and the uh, Olympics and so forth and so on, man. Just worldwide people. Roy Wood, how about him? I'm sure, I don't know if Elder Stewart got into that. But, man, all I can say, that glory that God put on them uh, to make them look good, we call it uh, the, the glorious history and uh, uh, all of the glorious things uh, that God did uh, for, uh, to release blessings uh, uh, and the feasts and the, not the defeats because we're not a defeated race we're about to put our feet on the devil's neck we're gonna he says all things are under my feet and sometimes look like we've been walked over stepped over stepped on sped on those kind of things but but i tell you what and all the glory of your presence we your temples give you reverence to the black race. So arise, get up to your rest and be blessed, oh God, as you get up out of the boat. That, that song says, So arise. We're talking to God because it looked sometimes as a race that God went to sleep like he did in the boat when there was a tumultuous storm and the disciples began to wake him up because he can sleep in the midst of the storm and it looks like he does not care. And the disciples are uh, awaken him and ask him, Master, carries that, that not that we pass, uh, that we perish. Uh, one back as I continue that song in a moment uh, one song right back in the early uh, 70s they said master the tempest is raging that's what we're saying and the, all those things are tossed high yes the skies are all covered with blackness but, but we, we waking him up oh, look, it look like he will never draw nigh but we call we wake up the Jesus of our race we wake up the Jesus of our godfathers our, our mothers and our grandfathers our godfathers that's for drug dealers that may be listening and gang bangers and not the godfathers uh, but the God of the mention uh, as we used to hear our older deacons getting on their knees and say Lord I come before you I bow before you as an empty pitcher not a baseball pitcher but a container I bow before you we bow before you uh, as an empty pitcher before uh, a full fountain knowing that you said my people have committed two evils uh, in Jeremiah 2.13 uh, they have forsaken me uh, the fountain of living waters uh, and they have hewed them out cisterns that can hold no water look like we can't hold our babies through miscarriage and abortion look like we can't hold down job we can't hold down uh, uh, our communities are being destroyed uh, but you said my people uh, have committed two evils uh, over in uh, Jeremiah 2.13 uh, they have forsaken me the fountain uh, of living water so we bow before you as an empty pitcher before a full fountain uh, saying guide us O thou great Jehovah pilgrim through this barren land uh, we are weak but thou art mighty hold us with your powerful we've not been able to hold on to our jobs our houses our communities uh, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Jesus, uh, as the, uh, our fathers, uh, forefathers, we pray. We pray to the God of Abraham. Uh, we pray to the God of Isaac. Uh, we pray to the God of Jacob. Uh, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the family, the whole family in heaven and earth, the whole race, uh, past, present, and future, that you would grant, Dorio is the word, grant that you would lavishly provide uh, all the moral, all the mental, all the intellectual, all the financial, all of the spiritual strength that we need we need oh God your anointing sin times of refreshing on the whole black race to the fathers to the grandfathers to the God to the grandfathers of God and to the aunts and the uncles to the teachers to the coaches we need the whole
whole village with a fresh anointing. Uh, you said in your word of God, uh, it is the anointing. Uh, you said that the, the, the anointing shall destroy the yoke, uh, the burden removing, the yoke breaking power of the living God. I bow my knees to God. Uh, that you would grant us according to the riches of your glory that we might be strengthened with might, with your spirit in our inner man, that we might be able to comprehend with all saints uh, what is the length, what is the depth, what is the breadth, what is the height, that we may go to new heights, uh, that we may go to new depths, uh, that we'll say uh, that we're so deep that we, 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 we are planted. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. We're like a tree. Trees are right and planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. We're steadfast. Uh, we're unmovable. We will not experience genocide. We will not self-destruct God. Uh, that you said as we bow our knees into the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that you would grant, grant us according to the riches of your glory that we might be strengthened with your spirit with might uh, in our inner man comprehend what is the breadth uh, what is the length what is the depth uh, and dear God what is the height take us to heights uh, unimaginable take us to width uh, let us be worldwide in our dealings uh, and not just localize it's my prayer uh, for the whole village uh, that we being rooted uh, the depths rooted not six feet under rooted and grounded in love God uh, give us more love more love more love uh, more power more of you in our life more love we need more power more the glorious power of you in our lives and we will worship you with all of our hearts and we will worship you with all of our soul and we will worship you with all of our strength for you are our help yes you are that we might be filled Ephesians says with the fullness of God himself step down into the earth realm drop down Jesus the son of the living God uh, seeing then uh, as we've heard the presenters give us history that we are surrounded Hebrews 12 says uh, with a great cloud of witnesses uh, let us hold fast uh, uh, dear God this whole black race here uh, dear God we see the fabric it look like one big gi gigantic flag African flag there that represents the African continent God God where we had uh, uh, in continents from the continent of Africa and Africa of America in our uh, very pedigree to God uh, you say in the last days uh, there will be a spirit uh, that will be released over every continent every county every city every country every church every community I call it the C factor over every continent uh, we will deal with incontinence in a moment over every country uh, over every uh, cotton state like Alabama over every county over every city over every church over every community over every cottage over every family uh, father over every career all of those seas we call it in the name of Jesus uh, but it will take the Christ the last sea the anointing the Christ the anointed one the Christos uh, the anointing Christ in our continents Christ in our country Christ uh, in, in our counties uh, in our states the, uh, the cotton state Alabama Christ in our cities the anointing Christ in our community, Christ in our churches, uh, Christ uh, in our cottages and home, uh, Christ in our careers, uh, and Christ in everything that we do, uh, Christ being the center of our lives. God, we thank you for the anointing that destroys the yoke, the burden, uh, the burden of God will be removed because of the anointing. We need the glory of God. Uh, let the glory of God drip down into everyone that is viewing me. May my God supply every one of your needs like he did with Alexander Hamilton. May he so impact uh, every dimension of your life. Uh, may he give you the power to get wealth. I empower you with the favor of God. Uh, Luke 2.52 May we increase in wisdom in stature and in favor with God and with man uh, even as he said I must be about my father's business uh, may you give us the real understanding God of entertainment uh, not just to be singers and dancers uh, and playwriters God but the real entertainment for Hebrews tells us in chapter 13 be mindful how you entertain uh, strangers for 
some uh, have entertained angels uh, unawares. God, we ask for the angels of God to entertain us, uh, to remove the stain, uh, to give us the ability, the agility, the quickness, uh, and the nimbleness to run through troops and leap over a wall. Uh, we understand what's in our history, the Venus and the Serenas and the, all of the Tiger Woods and the Willie Mays and the Hank Aarons and all those of God, but uh, more than anything, God, uh, give us the ability beyond our strength so we can do all things uh, through Christ. Uh, and as it relates to medicine, God, we appraise, we appreciate uh, raising up the doctors and the optometrists like Jackie Stewart and Dr. Wanaki, but we ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would heal our land. Uh, we understand that we're black people, but you said uh, there's a higher call than that if my people, uh, yes, your people are black people and white people, but Second Chronicles says if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, uh, turn from their wicked ways, then will we hear from heaven. Uh, we heard from heaven. Uh, you've given us in our storied glorious history, we heard heaven talk to our prophets like Dr. King and Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and all those foot soldiers. Uh, we need to hear from heaven again, oh God. Uh, speak to our hearts. Uh, speak to our minds. Uh, give us the tongue of the learned and the mind of Christ uh, that we may know how to speak a word uh, in season to those that are weary, those that are oppressed. The Christ in us, uh, may the anointing, uh, you, how you anointed Jesus Christ, uh, anoint everyone that's in every field that's been mentioned, uh, those that are in medicine, God, uh, those that are fighting for civil rights. Uh, when we see the Trayvon Martin cases and all the Floyd uh, cases that God, uh, all of the domestic violence, suicides, homicide, uh, we ask for an anointing to get you would navigate us to a place where Paul says, uh, yes, we were depressed and oppressed. We would not have you ignorant uh, of, of what Satan tried to do in 2 Corinthians. But he said uh, that uh, we would pray to the God in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 uh, that delivered 2 uh, Corinthians 1 round verse uh, 8, 9, and 10 to the God that delivered uh, that delivered uh, and uh, that means in the past and doth deliver D-O-T-H and doth deliver and it says and will yet deliver we call on the God of the Hebrew boys uh, that you would uh, deliver our boys that uh, you would deliver us from evil our father those that are, have fathers uh, fatherless you'll be a father to the fatherless our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name uh, thy kingdom come thy will be done uh, in earth as it is in heaven uh, give us this day our daily bread uh, that we don't have to steal and rob and sell drugs uh, give us this day God of Bethlehem uh, give us the communion to keep us alive uh, for this calls many are weak many are sick and many even die uh, give us this day our daily bread uh, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not uh, into temptations uh, tests that we cannot pass uh, medical tests uh, legal tests bar tests Tests, uh, any tests of uh, uh, any kind of biopsies and MRIs and CAT scans, uh, all of that in the name of Jesus, lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from the evil, deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the devil, oh God, uh, deliver us from evil, for thine uh, is the KPG, uh, thine is the kingdom, uh, thine is the power, and thine is the glory. We'll give you the honor, God, uh, for your glorious anointing. I feel uh, the glory of the living God uh, resting on me now, uh, releasing it into your home, uh, into every occupation, uh, into every field, uh, that you would do something for us now. Uh, seeing then, even with these presenters, that we've been surrounded in our very midst uh, by such a great cloud of witnesses, uh, those like Dr. Cadelia uh, that have taken it from the temple of God, got into their educational fields uh, and didn't compromise in singing operate. So operate on us as you told us uh, the gifts of the spirit that there are many, many gifts, uh, uh, but, the, uh, but there is one God, uh, the operations of God, many administrations, but one Lord. Uh, and there are diversities of gifts. So we call upon the administration, uh, the diversity and the operation out of the gifts of the spirit. They are previews of the nine gifts of the spirit. We call for the, the administration of the Lord, the operation of our God, the diversity of our spirit.
Spirit because if you have a gift uh, it must not be uh, uh, isolated uh, it must not be nepotism uh, it must not be uh, relegated uh, to one race let there be doors open that we will see people that look like us talk like us act like us just as in the Super Bowl I call for the operations of God and to be tempered with uh, and overlaid with the gifts of the Spirit if you don't know what I'm talking about I'm talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 I got to close this thing Paul says in chapter 12 verse 1 uh, we will not uh, come to dumb idols uh, a God an idol is a piece of material a thing uh, that represents God look like God has been made God but it can't talk it cannot feel it cannot hear it cannot listen but Hebrews says seeing then that we have a great high priest uh, Jesus the son of the living God that's passed into the heavens let us hold fast to the profession uh, of our faith you've heard these professions uh, you've heard sports you've heard medicines uh, you've heard entertainment let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering for he faithful and that don't let us forsake the assembly because he's easily touched with the feelings of our infirmities it's, he's not a dumb idol uh, he's not a stature he's not a piece of wood uh, he's not some yoga position humming and meditating and chanting he's a God that answers prayer and he gives glory through three and four visiting the iniquity of several generations so father we bless you seeing then that we are surrounded by such a great uh, cloud of witnesses that we've just seen with Dr. Adams the God as we just seen with Carrie Napper God and all that he does even in his natural occupation that men are not so macho learning about sports uh, that they can't lift their hand uh, they can lift weights but they can't clap their hands uh, they don't understand deliver our men God and we'll be mindful to give you the praise the honor and all the glory thank you to God that the God of uh, the God of glory of Abraham the God of glory of our forefathers the God that we lift every voice I want you to in the spirit of our national anthem lift every voice uh, as we'll be continuing this celebration on this coming Sunday I want you to lift every voice wherever you lift up your head uh, oh ye gate lift up your voice and shout unto God with the voice of triumph for his glory has done marvelous things uh, for the glorious history and feast oh clap your hands uh, 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 all ye people and shout unto God with the voice of triumph for the Lord most high is terrible he's a great king over all the earth he shall subdue the people under us and nation under our feet sing praises to God sing praises for the shields Psalm 47 the shields of the earth belong unto God for he is greatly exalted I better quit while I can so father I pray right now for everything that's got to do God with the vision effects everything that's got to do with the medicine with our children father as Dr. Stewart uh, has so delved into that and everything got to do God where we can't see our way not just physically to God without where we not have vision where we look stuck uh, your word declares in Acts 10 38 uh, how God anointed Jesus who went about doing good healing all those that were oppressed uh, John 8 31 32 says he whom the son sets free is free indeed and one of the ways you express the gratitude for that somebody said all comes to money don't all live all roads lead to money well it can it can in Deuteronomy 26 when it talks about bringing the first fruits putting it in the basket read Deuteronomy 26 it will give you the instructions on bringing in Deuteronomy 26 verses 1 through 3. The first verse is going to say, bring of the first fruit. Put it in a basket. Take it before the priest. But then it says, reflect from verse 5 through about 12. Say, I was once, I was bound, I was oppressed. It gives the whole history on how God delivered them. So if he's done glorious feet, if he uses glory, his power, his wisdom, his favor, gave you, you said, no, I did that myself. I went to school. Well, you had his mind. He gave you perfect peace because your mind stayed on him. You have the mind of Christ. That's why you're that smart. First Corinthians 2, 16. You have the mind of Christ. Start slipping and start losing. I remember I was going through such a storm. Some things could blow your very mind. And I call scriptures off. I have no notes here. And I was saying to God in the year of the good shepherd, I remember saying, God, a, a season of my life, God, I feel that these struggles are causing me to lose my mind. But big mama told me, 
get you some anointed oil and anoint your head with oil and say he restored my soul, my intellect, my mind, my emotions, my feelings, and God will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. So get you an offering of a glorious feast. I feel the glory of God to help you defeat what's coming against you in the physical, what's coming against you morally and mentally. Defeat uh, that spirit of anxiety, panic attack, and all those things that's coming against you. There's a number on the screen. If you would like to sing all the glorious history of God, God wants to do something uh, monumental, historical, unprecedented, what eyes have not seen and what ears not heard have not heard as we have been bringing to you the black history special. Sometimes we get a lot of information, but we don't put the anointing in it. But man, we put the gifts of the spirit on that because we don't serve a dumb idol in 1 Corinthians 12. And when you understand the operations of God, the administrations of the Lord, and the diversity that, uh, that goes with gifts, because your gift needs to be diversified, then it will go on down there uh, and, and list what those giftings are. The three gods of administration, operation, and diversity, what they're doing is they're about to put in your uh, arsenal. In your bag, your, the cat is going to carry you the, the nine gifts of the spirit. You're going to need those in your occupation. You're going to need the, the verbal gifts, tongues and, and uh, 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 prophecy, interpretation of tongues. Those are verbal. You're going to need the power gift, right? Uh, you'll need the faith. You're going to need the miracles, all of that opera and the gifts of healings. That's what those three are bringing to keep your body healed. And then, then the greatest of all of the three, the top three, you'll need the re revelatory gifts. That is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, wisdom, what he's going to do in the future like he showed Joseph under his administration. May God give you wisdom for the future. May he give you a word of knowledge, how to solve the problems that you're facing now. And uh, may he give you most of all, most of all, discerning of spirits. That's the one we need. So many spirits have gone into the earth, and they are antichrist. You may be succeeding, but you're in the middle of spirits. May he give you, reveal to you discerning spirits. That's why he says over there in 1 Corinthians 12, before he lists the gifts, that anybody that calls uh, Jesus Christ accursed can't call him Lord. If you curse him, then you're under another spirit. So may the Lord give you discerning of spirits wherever you go, whoever you're trying to mate with and date with and, and all that kind of stuff. You need discerning of spirits. Amen. Discerning of the spirit of the blood, the spirit of the, the blood of Jesus, the spirit of the angels and uh, the spirit of the word, the Holy Spirit, demonic spirit. I pray now lift your hands as a people. Parents need the gifts of the spirit. Preachers need gifts of the spirit. The people of God need the gifts of the spirit. Every professionals need the gifts of the spirit. May God download to you on reserve every gift of the spirit that you would need to operate to where you need to go. And may the glory. And when you get in your prayer life. And the glory uh, is as high in your prayer life and in church. It's that glory that's like a Jerry Curl uh, activator. <laughs> your hair has the potential to curl. It just needs some activator. And I activate the gifts of the spirit for our race. That glory will activate it. Like uh, the, the Jerry Curl uh, spray will activate all that kind of stuff. Right? And th until that time. You begin to write um, MTCFC 73256 if you would like to sow a seed for history that you will not be history and you'll be a thing, you won't be a thing of the past, but you have a glorious future, was, is, and is to come from the Lord God Almighty. Well, until that time, it's going to be off the chain. We're going to do something real special this coming Sunday. Well, Voices of Jew will be singing. I got another message. That, oh, that was just off the cuff. Didn't in, intend to go there. But you make sure you're in church on Sunday, first of all, for black history at 10 o'clock, and then, of course, we'll go into some teaching choir, and if you just want to just hear some glorious yoke-breaking power, then join us. Hey, guys, it went much longer than I thought, but thank you to all of our presenters. May you have no unnecessary warfare as a result of what you uh, have done. If I left anybody's name out, uh, don't lay it, uh, to my, uh, lay it to my head and not to my heart, amen, because I value all of you the same. God bless you.